Hello, and thank you for joining us for the inaugural Six Colleges webinar. My name is Matt McGann, Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Amherst College. And because Amherst begins with an A, I have the honor of hosting the first of our six sessions. Welcome to our audience joining us from 48 states and five continents. Good evening to those of you nearby me on the East Coast of the United States. Good afternoon to those of you joining from the West Coast. Good morning to those of you in places like China and the Philippines. And for those of you in places like Ethiopia and Mauritius, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you can get to sleep soon. Uh, I hope all of you will find tonight uh, helpful and insightful. This session will be recorded. You will be able to find the recording at sixcolleges.org after this session. Uh, the session is also being captioned. You can turn on closed captioning through Zoom. We're glad to be able to provide this for greater accessibility this evening. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, the deans of admission at some of the world's great colleges. Let me now allow them all to introduce themselves and will continue to do so in alphabetical order. So up first, Whitney. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Whitney Soule and I'm from Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. Hi everyone, my name is Art Rodriguez and I'm from Carleton College in Northville, Minnesota. Hi everyone, I'm Seth Allen from Pomona College, located in Claremont, California, right outside of LA. Good evening, my name is Jim Puck, and I'm uh, from Swarthmore College, located in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, located just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hi everyone, thanks for being with us. I'm Liz Creighton from Williams College in Western Massachusetts. That's our cast of characters for tonight. First up, to prove that we are really here in the spirit of cooperation, in just a moment, I'm going to ask my colleagues to say something awesome or unique, not about their own school, but about the school that comes after them in the alphabet. Following that, we'll discuss some of the things that all of our colleges have in common. In the spirit of cooperation, we'll be focusing tonight more on what small residential colleges like ours have in common and what we can offer students. While we're doing that, you can start thinking about sending your questions for the deans through the Zoom Q&A function, which we'll get to answering a little bit later. Okay, so something awesome about other schools. I'm up first, uh, and I get to tell you something cool about Bowdoin College, which is in the fabulous college town of Brunswick, Maine. Uh, when I give uh, students and families college advice, I often tell them to look for a college that matches their values and to try to understand a college's values by watching their actions and their priorities. So along those lines, I am so in awe of Bowdoin's actions around climate change. Uh, more than a decade ago, they were one of the earliest places uh, among colleges to say that they uh, would become carbon neutral. Uh, and they did so two years ago. They became one of the very first colleges in the country to achieve carbon neutrality, dramatically uh, decreasing greenhouse gas emissions on campus uh, through a variety of steps. Now, doing something like this requires a real institutional commitment. Bowdoin took a bold position as one of the real leaders in battling one of the most important struggles of our time, climate change. So for that, I say kudos, Bowdoin. Uh, you all are awesome. Thank you very much. And I get to talk a little bit about Carleton. And there are many things I love about Carleton. We have traveled together for a long time and I've gotten to know the school. And one of the things that I think is really representative is how Carleton is able to incorporate fun into building community and also in the approach to learning, even really complex things, there's a way to make it fun. But an example of this is the role that Frisbee plays at Carleton. So they have uh, an amazing Frisbee team, incredibly competitive. And so there's that as something for them to hang their hat on. But they also use Frisbee as a way for the first year students to get to know one, of the, one another right in orientation. They have a really fun exercise that involves Frisbees for students to have to introduce themselves to a lot of people and get to know one another 
right away. And for me, that's a really great example of how the college thinks about putting students in situations that have challenge, including just having to get to meet people when you're newly away from home and trying to settle in and to use a game that is representative of the school in so many competitive ways to be fun and interactive. So that would be one of the things I love most about Carleton. Thank you, Whitney. Um, so I have the opportunity to talk about Pomona College and what makes Pomona College um, an interesting place. Um, I would say that um, one of the things I've always been attracted to about Pomona is the fact that it's the founding member of the Claremont Colleges Consortium. And the reason I find this feature so attractive is because it's a unique system in American higher education that consists of seven independent institutions, five undergraduate and two graduate schools. And really what makes this a distinctive system is the fact that the seven campuses are contiguous. They're all connected, sitting on one square mile, that no matter how you transport yourself um, from campus to campus, you're likely gonna be doing that um, by on a bike, walking, and so it's easy to access each one of the campuses and really enjoy the opportunities that are offered at each one of the seven institutions. I will say though, as an undergraduate student, one of the things that students often talk about um, in terms of their um, time at Pomona and the Claremont system is the fact that you have many shared resources. You can cross register and take courses at the other institutions. Um, you have 6,000 undergraduate students total. And so that really expands what your experience can be like by being at Pomona. Additionally, the main library, dining halls, um, and other public events are also open to students across the campuses. So you really can begin to begin, begin um, to build a community, not just at Pomona, but at the other institutions as well. Um, even though there are many shared resources across um, the Claremont system, I think what's important to know is that each school is independent. Um, they each have their own set of courses, majors, graduation requirements, students, faculty and president. Um, so even though um, there are seven schools near each other, they're all very different from one another. Great. Thanks, Art. Um, I'm talking about Swarthmore College. Love Swarthmore College. And here's what I think you'd love about Swarthmore College, the juxtaposition of a, a residential liberal arts college on the outskirts of Philadelphia, one of the great East Coast cities, but the campus itself is an arboretum. So you have all of the advantages of being close by an urban area. You're on the main line to Philly. There's a train right into downtown 30th Street Station. But you get to have an educational setting in a, essentially a garden. There are very few campuses like that in the United States. So if you like the idea of close proximity to an urban center, but just a drop dead gorgeous campus, Swarthmore might be a place for you. Thank you, Seth. And I get to introduce Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, which I've had the great honor and pleasure of visiting uh, a couple times. And as I was trying to narrow and think about what I enjoy or appreciate most, uh, two things came to mind. One was social and one was academic. So I'm gonna squeeze two into one in my answer, but the first is social. They have an entries program where First years are uh, put in cohorts of about 25 and live with junior advisors to where they really get to know one another in a communal setting. And so I just appreciate the socialization that takes place uh, through the entry program. And then the second would be academic, which is the tutorial program, where students, two students, work individually with one faculty member and really are able to dive deep uh, into the learning and really are doing graduate level work at the undergraduate level. And I think that learning takes place at all our institutions, but I love how Williams has shaped it into the tutorial system based on the Oxford system uh, back in the day. And so for me, it's both a social and an academic piece. Thanks, Jim. I'm gonna take a page out of your book and end um, on two things that I love about Amherst. Um, the first is that Amherst is a place that I think offers students remarkable academic flexibility and that's due both to its curriculum, which is structured as an open curriculum and also its involvement in the five college consortium. Um, the second is that Amherst has had 
had a deep and long-standing commitment to diversity across many dimensions on its campus. And um, for those who might know anything about the Williams Amherst rivalry, it goes back several centuries. Um, and Amherst's commitment to uh, diversity is one of the things that I admire greatly about it, um, both for, uh, for the sheer commitment, but also because of the ways that it pushes um, Williams as a close rival and all of us to be better and do better. Um, so grateful to share the screen with Amherst and with all of you. Thank you. And uh, Liz just used the word uh, rivals. And uh, this is pretty unusual uh, in some ways for our six schools to be sharing the spotlight. Normally we compete against each other on the athletic fields and for top applicants all over the world. But uh, you know, we've obviously been watching and feeling the stress as coronavirus has forced us to cancel our visits to your cities, eliminate tours on our campuses, move to virtual only events. And in this context, among others, uh, joining forces and cooperating, uh, we think really makes sense. It's true. And over the years, uh, the six of us, or some mix of the six of us, are often in the same spaces at conferences where we're sharing best practices and innovative ideas. We might be traveling together to introduce our schools to students and families and counselors all around the world. And as we began to adapt to the pandemic challenges, we've talked together about really important issues. And we've come to two conclusions, among others. First, the world really needs people like our graduates who are out there tackling these really big problems, like coronavirus, which is a public health problem that's affecting all of us. But it's also not just about a vaccine. It's about a culture, and it's about beliefs and the public's trust in science. And there are issues like climate change, which Matt mentioned earlier, a topic where there's so much that goes into that global conversation that isn't just about carbon or being carbon neutral. And if you've been thinking about anti-racism or the role of policing and voting rights, those are really big conversations. And they have to include history and economics, urban studies and government. And so we know that right now in high school, you might be frustrated because you go to math, and then you go to your history class, and then you go to chemi chemistry, and they feel really separate. But that's not how the world works. And so we all have graduates who are in healthcare and in medical school and doing graduate research in biology. And we have graduates who are working in technology and public policy and journalism, economics, data analysis, education, and human behavior. And so our schools are focused on providing a world-class education in small classes with a lot of attention from faculty who are experts in their fields. And it means that our students are better prepared to work on the types of teams that are needed for these really big problems. And sometimes those are really small teams, which is kind of like who we are tonight, a small team working together. Our second conclusion was that our schools have a lot in common. We have wonderful, smart students, amazing faculty, countless academic opportunities and extracurricular offerings, and all of our student, all of our institutions work tirelessly to provide for and support every one of our students. Of course, there are plenty of differences too, including our locations, climate, campus cultures, and traditions, and my colleagues will share more. But right now, we know that you and your family are scrambling to get as much information as you can about colleges, often without being able to visit, which adds to making your college search slightly more difficult. We understand this challenge, and as Whitney and Matt have already shared, that is exactly why we have chosen to work together. At our institutions, we encourage students, some might even say that we require them to collaborate on assignments, projects, and other activities so we are taking a bit of our own sage advice and giving you a look at six of the top liberal arts colleges in the country by saving you time in front of one screen. Nice. Right, so I'll follow up from what Art just said. And, and what are these things that we have in common? I'll start and then I'll let my colleagues jump in. First, as you've been hearing from us, we're all residential liberal arts colleges. Residential means that a majority of our students, well, in a, in a normal non-pandemic year, live on campus in personal communities. All of our schools enroll between 1,500 and 2,000 students. 
But being residential, it's more than just walls and beds. We're intentional in building communities of students who are different from one another in their background and in their interests, where they're from and what they're studying. When we talk about working in team, that means listening to different voices and opinions. Someone whose culture is different from yours who brings a new perspective. That happens in the classroom, but the foundations come from living and working and eating and studying together. There's no syllabus that governs what students take away from their interactions with their peers, yet blending together students with different outlooks, different interests, and different backgrounds provides that grist that marks valuable self-discovery. The benefits of this kind of peer learning or horizontal learning accrue well after graduation from college too. Consider the employee who's able to work with a diverse group of colleagues, learning from them and adopting from them what she sees as valuable and helpful in solving challenges and in innovating solutions. This person will be better equipped to take on new opportunities and better equipped to deal with uncertainty. Such employees, those who work well in teams, as you've been hearing, and who provide synergy in their work environment and who can harness the power of individual differences, well, they're the most prized in today's modern organizations. Thank you, Seth. So I'll tackle the liberal arts, which can sometimes be a bit of a challenge because the liberal arts are not technically liberal and it's more than just traditional arts courses. The origin of a liberal arts education was to prepare people to be engaged citizens of the world, to understand the basics of history, language, philosophy, science, as well as the arts, to understand and explore ethics and judgment, and ask how a society should govern itself and what makes life meaningful. That's still true today, where students, in addition to taking courses to fill a major, to fulfill a major, may also take courses that help them broaden their perspectives and add context to the major or explore a range of disciplines for the intellectual exercise of pushing oneself beyond just one discipline. For example, if you're a pre-med student, you'll be taking a lot of biology and chemistry, but medicine also involves data analysis, which was mentioned before. It may require an understanding of environmental effects or cultural differences. Most classes by design and overall will be small and include significant exposure to and interaction with faculty, both in the classroom and in the lab. And the good news is you may also pursue any major you wish. For example, my college roommate is a doctor and people are often surprised to learn that he majored in history while in college. He realized that he wouldn't be taking any history in medical school and really wanted to take a range of courses as an undergraduate. He pursued history, obviously, political science, classics, as well as English, while also fulfilling his pre-med requirements. Typically, 30 to 40% of the pre-med students at our institutions are not biology majors. You can major in anything and we still prepare you for all fields post bachelor's degree. The liberal arts offers courses in the humanities as well as the social sciences and the natural sciences. Early on in your career, you'll focus on exploration versus specialization, but then that often comes later with your major. I also think of an example of one of our science faculty who feels that a lot of the high school curriculum is based on memorization and regurgitation, something you may be familiar with. Uh, she believes the best residential liberal arts colleges teach students to sight read. Basically, we give students the skills and tools they need to solve problems they haven't seen and also to become lifelong learners. Our institutions will teach you how to think critically, how to write analytically, and how to communicate effectively across the disciplines. Many of our graduates will go on for specialized degrees immediately, while others go straight into the workforce. Our students often find consulting and management positions in every field before pursuing graduate work, given the strength of the problem solving, analytical, critical thinking, communication, and team building skills. And in today's complicated world, we believe a liberal arts education has never been more important. Thanks, Jim. We're getting close to the time. I'm going to turn it over to you all for questions. But before we do, I just want to take a minute to talk about one more thing that we all have in common, which is our commitment to making college affordable. 
While there are sticker prices can be scary at first glance, the majority of students on each of our campuses receive financial aid, and we are all committed to meeting 100% of the demonstrated need of all students who are admitted. It's important to know that our financial aid programs don't just help students get by, but also to thrive. They cover things that might seem obvious, like housing and meal plans and textbooks, but they go beyond that too, to support things like study abroad and internship and fellowship opportunities. As my colleagues have shared, you'll learn and grow on our campuses outside of the classroom just as much as you will inside it. So we make sure that our financial aid programs support your whole experience, not just the academic one. Many of our students don't take out any loans at all to attend our institutions, and those who do tend to graduate with debt levels that are less than half the national average. I think all six of us would agree that the investment our colleges make in financial aid is our most important one of all. It's really an investment in remarkable students like all of you and the transformative things that we know you'll go on to do after spending four years on any of our campuses. Please be in touch with any of us in the coming months. We understand how much financial uncertainty the pandemic has introduced, and we're eager to work with you and your family to talk about just how affordable our schools can really be. Thanks, Liz. Uh, so in, as, as mentioned, in just a moment, we'll begin fielding your questions. Uh, but first, I want to note that we have sessions coming up over the next couple of months that will go into all of these topics in more detail, including why liberal arts college students have such high satisfaction with the academic and research offerings, that'll be our next session, and why liberal arts graduates tend to have such strong career and graduate school outcomes, that'll be a little bit later on. I encourage you to sign up for reminders for those sessions if you haven't already, or watch the recordings if you can't make it in person. You can do all of that and more at our website, sixcolleges.org. I see that many questions are coming in and given that we have more than a thousand participants tonight, uh, which is very exciting, uh, I already know that we will not get to all of your questions. So we're gonna prioritize questions that can be answered by any of these six deans of admission here tonight. If you have questions like, how can a Swarthmore student cross-register at Bryn Mawr? Or tell me about the environmental analysis major at Pomona. Those questions you should register for a school-specific information session through each school's website. Uh, we're all offering regular information sessions online. Okay, so let's harness the great knowledge and insight of these six deans of admission. Uh, and uh, we'll do the first question here, uh, which I will direct to Whitney. Uh, and this is a question that has been asked. Uh, this is by far the most popular question in our Q&A box tonight. Um, I'll, I'll read you the way that one of our participants, uh, Georgiana, uh, phrased it. Georgiana writes, how will colleges assess students who do and don't submit standardized test scores on an equal playing field this year? That is a great question. And Matt is right. We're getting asked that question every which way. Um, and we are all able to talk about what test optional is going to look like this year. Since Matt pitched it to me, I'm going to cover it for everybody. And there's a long range of experience on this panel around what test optional practices look like. I can tell you that Bowdoin has been test optional for about 50 years. And so um, I can speak to the fact that it is truly possible to build an evaluation system that allows test scores to simply be an option in what students submit for us to review in the same way that if a school has optional interviews or some other optional piece of an application like maybe an optional extra recommendation or an optional art supplement or something like that anything that's optional really does mean optional it means that our schools have figured out that we can make really good decisions for our schools. We feel like we have the information we need based on the material that we actually require. So if you submit the material that is required of any one of these schools, you have fully completed your application and we're prepared to do a really thorough and thoughtful review of what you submitted to us. Anything that you choose to submit to our schools that's optional, including test scores, becomes an additional layer of how we might get to understand you as an applicant. And it, it gets put together with the things you've already shown us. So my advice would be, if you have scores available to send and you're deciding whether or not to include them in your, in your application in test optional space, 
you would want to include your scores if you feel like there's something that add a positive layer to the other materials you know you've submitted as requirements and that's entirely personal and subjective if you want to see what kinds of scores do get submitted to our schools all of us publish that that um, material on our websites and in our publications but those are just guides. Those are not rules by which students have to compare their test scores to decide whether or not to submit them. You wanna think about your test scores relative to your environment and your high school and what those scores mean to you and what you wanna show our schools. And I would say that that's true for other optional materials as well. If you feel like they represent you in a way that is authentic and feels positive, then we wanna see those optional materials. Thanks for that great question, by the way. And because this is still by far the most popular question, I, I'd love to hear if other people want to hop in, but I, I just want to say one quick sentence about this, which is test optional means test optional. It's not test optional wink, uh, test optional, uh, you know, here's the secret. Test optional means test optional. Colleagues, anything else? Yeah, I think I'll add just one more thing, Matt, maybe to put in a, sort of an even finer point on your statement just now. Um, you know, we hear from a lot of your counselors, it's, it's our way of having an understanding of um, what you're all um, trying to deal with right now. And we know that for many of you, you are trying to figure out whether or not you'll be able to take a standardized test this fall. And I just want to reiterate what Matt said. Nothing matters more than your safety and well being, your family's safety and well being. And for those of us who have introduced test optional policies more recently than Bowdoin did 50 years ago, it's because we wanted to make sure that you could prioritize your safety and wellness this fall. Um, so, as Matt said, there's no wink involved here. We're test optional because we want you to have the flexibility you need to make the decision that's best for you in the coming months. Awesome. Another uh, big theme of questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A uh, recognizes that it's a little bit harder this year to learn uh, about colleges in the pandemic. Uh, a lot of us don't have uh, tours uh, offered. Some campuses are bubbled like the NHL or the NBA. I'm going to read to you uh, and I'm going to ask Art to, to field this question first. Um, this is how, how one uh, parent phrased it. Uh, this parent writes, our daughter started last year at Middlebury, another fine residential liberal arts college, uh, started Middlebury as a freshman, a big move from the Bay Area in California to a small school in a state 3,000 miles away. We had never been anywhere near. There is no way she would have chosen Middlebury had she not been able to visit. How can you share the culture of our colleges, the kind of students who go there, without being able to physically visit? What are you going to do to put prospective students in touch with current students? How can my son truly get a feel for your college? Art, what do you think? Thank you, Matt, and, and that it's a great question, particularly at this moment. Um, when we know that students and families are trying to really drill down and understand different institutions um, and, and the culture on, on each one of these campuses. Um, I think when it comes to um, getting a, a sense of that, that culture, of the, sort of the flavor of each one of our institutions, um, we are also, I would say, as deans and staff, thinking about opportunities for students um, prospective students to connect with our students, our faculty, other individuals at the college who, who really represent um, what it means to be connected to each one of our institutions. Um, and you should definitely take the opportunity to visit our websites, see what opportunities are there for that to take place, um, because that's how we're really conveying to, to students and, and families um, information about our, our, our um, campuses. I would also recommend that even though you can't physically visit um, or take a formal tour and information uh, tour of each of our campuses, is that you should look for our virtual tours um, on our websites. Um, really, it will really give you at least some sense of um, the environment, a sense of facilities, a, a sense of our character um, through many of our students who are often leading um, these um, 
online virtual tours of our campus as well. And so that would be another great way to begin to sort of steep yourself in understanding um, our campuses. Um, further, I would say that we all have in some ways um, robust alumni admissions programs um, or alums who support our efforts to really share um, information about our campuses. And so you should take advantage of reaching out to our admissions offices and asking for um, those opportunities to speak to individuals who were a part of our communities, have now have some distance from our communities, um, but still can share vividly many of the experiences they've had um, on our campuses and what that might mean for you as a, as a prospective student, um, as an admitted student um, on our campuses. Um, I think that we would all agree um, on this panel that, um, that we're looking forward to the day that we can reopen our spaces um, to allow you to, to visit. I think that we probably all have um, our fingers crossed that come this spring, um, we are in a position to allow um, and have students and families uh, visit um, when we think things are safer and certainly we'll be the first to let you know uh, that those opportunities are readily available um, and accessible um, for students and, and families. So be sure um, if you haven't already requested information um, or um, signed up through the six colleges website um, to get on our um, to get on our distribution list so that we can let you know um, when things um, change and, and potentially are able to share with you directly um, that, that we are open um, for business in the more traditional sense um, so that you can get a feel for our campuses. But reach out to us. Um, I think that's the most important thing I can share. Reach out to us. We are all eager to connect with you um, and connect with you and, and, and tell you about our institutions, and it's not just the admissions office um, staff who will be doing that. We're looking for a myriad of ways in which all of our community can represent the institution um, to really provide you with a good sense of what our campuses have to offer you academically, socially, um, and in terms of its environment. Yeah, and I will just piggyback quickly and just say I, I echo everything Art mentioned, but also if there could be, and again, it depends on where you're coming from and how many students have gone to liberal arts colleges, but look ahead or look back and say, is there a junior or someone ahead of me who may be a first year or a sophomore at one of these institutions from my high school that did attend that I can talk to who may be at home right now? Uh, with you that you can connect with. So find those students. Uh, coming from Texas and going east to college, I didn't visit half the schools. I, I couldn't afford to. So we have to remember too, some visit, but many do not. Most of our international students, their first time on our campuses is when they arrive. So they've done that research through online. We're seeing a lot more blogging by now by our current students to share that sense of culture. Because to be honest, they don't really want to hear from us. They want to hear from the current students, right? They would love to be on campus sitting in a class or going to lunch in the cafeteria. But because they can't do that, they still can't connect virtually with real life students and or recent high school grads from your area. So you now have an experience at Middlebury that you might share with current students um, or one of these six institutions or others not here tonight. So again, also look in your local community for folks who may have gone, not just alums who've been out 10, 15, 20 years, but maybe recent high school grads. All right, I want to bring Seth's voice into the conversation and it's going to be for the, que the next question that is the most frequently asked. I have at least a dozen versions of, of this question here in the Q&A and I'm going to read you the way that Molly wrote it. So thanks for writing in Molly. Molly writes, I'm not sure if you have had lots of students defer this semester because of the pandemic. Do, uh, and it is true that we all have uh, more students than usual who have requested and been granted gap years. So if you have, Molly writes, can you talk about what impact that might have on admitting the class of 2025? Great, thanks for that question, Molly. Um, I think it's a question we're gonna be wrestling with all year, quite frankly, because as Matt said, we all have larger numbers than usual. I think there's a couple of ways campuses might think about this. Um, and we're all going to do it in a way that makes sense for our own institution. Um, one, uh, because 
there has been somewhere between slightly to more than slightly decreased enrollment on campuses, it may be possible that there will be larger first year classes on some or all of our campuses next year. Um, second, because we're all interested, because we're small institutions in getting as precisely correct the right number of students in the entering class as possible, we all make use of our wait list. It may be that this year we factor in less uh, cushion for the wait list in order to maximize the number of offers that we can make to new applicants to the class of 2025. Those are two of the things that I can think of that schools will very likely consider in thinking about how to mitigate the impact of a larger number of students who have elected to defer uh, their enrollment this year. Yeah, I think I'd just add, thank you, Seth. Um, I want everybody on this call to know, I think we'll all agree that we are all going to have robust opportunities for students to be admitted to our schools. And that's true uh, at schools across the country who've uh, experienced a greater number of students deferring this year. So as Seth said, we're gonna be grappling with this in part because um, the issue is impacted not only by students who are applying to the class of 2025, but also by our current students who are still trying to figure out, will they have the opportunity to study away next year? Will that be safe? Um, for many right now, it's not. Um, for some of our current students who have um, changed their enrollment plans right now in response to the pandemic, there are a bunch of different factors um, that will sort of come together to impact the decisions that we make. But um, I think we all feel confident saying that while this upcoming admission cycle is going to look different than past ones, there will be ample opportunities um, for students like you who've joined us tonight to be admitted to all of our institutions. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, and the next question I want to read to you, I, I see a, a few different ways. Uh, and the one I'm going to read and I'm going to ask Jim to take the first shot at this comes from Aditi. Uh, and Aditi writes, with schools getting shut down in May, a lot of juniors weren't able to do their extracurriculars or attend you know, states or nationals uh, or you know, the big competitions for their extracurriculars. How do we still show our passion and interest for extracurriculars, even though we were not able to continue with them junior and senior year? Yeah, thank you, DT, for that question. I think it's really important. And it's uh, an anxiety and a concern that all students have. And we too have it as staff members. There are actually gonna be components of the common application and an area for you to fill in and explain how COVID impacted you, either academically or extra curricularly, are there things that couldn't be continued? Um, and we still wanna see what you were involved in even up until the time you had to go remote. Some students were able to continue things remotely, others were not, and that's okay. So we will take you where you are. There's no plus or minus for having continued every activity or, or started two or three more in the time of COVID. We just need to understand the context of what was shut down, what was available, both academically and extracurricularly. And we also know moving into the fall for senior year, it may continue. We also don't know, just like you're questioning what may colleges look like, we're wondering what will high schools look like? Will you be starting remotely? Will it be hybrid? Will you be in person? Will you be able to continue at the same level? So we're gonna see that in your short answer essays. Uh, I believe uh, Common Application Coalition give a section where you can explain some things. So it, it's a way to just inform us about activities that may have been continued, some that may have been discontinued. I would have liked to continue this, but could not. So we're not assuming you dropped everything uh, just because you, you got bored or, or sick of it. But we recognize everyone sort of there was a big stop at some point. Some things picked up again, some things didn't. We also may see that if you have a counselor in a counselor recommendation uh, or even teacher recommendations, teachers, we, we really wanna know how you're doing in the classroom, but often they know you as students outside as well. And so sometimes that can be insightful. So we're sort of piecing things together and building context from your essays, your recommendations and your activity list. We are looking sort of for commitment versus um, quantity, right? It's not about 
start, uh, joining 20 clubs and starting number 21, but what has been your commitment to any two or three things? And COVID may have interrupted that and actually giving you an opportunity to, to try something new or to pick something up again. But we understand there's gonna be a big asterisk, both probably on the transcript and on your extracurricular page. And we'll work with you on that. Always wanting to pause in case anybody else wants to hop in. Uh, early on, I saw a question that I thought was interesting uh, about um, what are, how do classes work at liberal arts colleges? Uh, are there big lectures? Is there lots of, of discussion? Um, how does that go? Liz, do you want to take that and talk a little bit about what you might find at colleges like ours? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Matt. And that's a great question. And I think um, in some ways, understanding what the classroom experience is like is a really important part of understanding why liberal arts colleges are the special places that they are. Um, so on each of our campuses, you'll find a range of uh, sort of classroom experiences. They'll run the gamut from small classes, anything from independent studies that you might be working on one on one with faculty um, to tutorial classes um, that Jim mentioned earlier to what is probably most common on our campuses, which is a small sort of seminar style discussion. Um, and at most of our places, the average class size is about 12 or 14. And so I know some people on this call have had this experience in their secondary school. If you've had, if you've not, a typical kind of classroom experience on our campuses is a sort of big wooden table with, as I said, maybe 10, 12, 14 students sitting around it with a professor. Sometimes the classes actually even happen outside. It's not just in college view books where you see that. It actually happens um, at some of our places as well. There are definitely some larger classes too. And so most often I think you'll find those in uh, sort of 100 level, so entry level classes in departments that are quite popular. So um, you could imagine Psychology 101 or Economics 101, Biology 101, classes that are often sort of entry classes to move forward in a major. Um, but even on campus or even in those larger uh, classes on campus like ours, um, you'll often have maybe 75 or 100 students at a max compared to five or 600 at a larger university. And the other thing is that at all of our schools, Faculty do a lot of work to take even those larger classes and break them down into something smaller. Um, so we probably each have different names for them at Williams. If you're in a large lecture class of about 100, that will also get broken down as an example into a smaller conference where you'll meet with nine or 10 other students. Jim shaking his head, Whitney, perhaps that's a term you guys use too. Um, where you'll meet with nine or 10 other students for that small seminar type discussion. Um, I think the one thing we can probably all agree on is that it's hard to hide in classes at liberal arts colleges and that's the really wonderful thing about the intellectual experience. It doesn't mean you always have to be talking and always raising your hand, but it's an incredible learning experience where you're, you're sharing kind of the, uh, the learning opportunity, not only with your peers, but also with faculty who really become like intellectual peers and friends along the way. Um, and that can happen in a range of different classroom settings. I just want to I just want to add to what uh, Liz said. Um, the, the the reason for a small class, the reason you might want a small class is that it is not meant as a medium for force feeding you information. Lectures excel at that. If all you want to do is sit back and spectate and listen to information coming your way. Go sit in a 500 person lecture hall. You can listen to a fantastic professor who will educate 500 people at a time. On the other hand, if what you're seeking is um, maybe more understanding or wisdom about a subject, where there's not necessarily an easy or a right answer, and where understanding and awareness comes through debate and dialogue, disagreement, failure, then you want a small class because that can only happen in a small class where you're called upon to give your opinion. You have a peer who gives another opinion. So there's some sort of synthesis that comes along. Other people jump in. 
And you gain this wildly rich, diverse perspective on a subject that maybe at first blush seemed fairly simplistic. And yet as people talk and they, they offer their own unique perspective on that, you begin to see that there's a, there's a dimension to this information that you hadn't considered. And it's in being able to consider new possibilities about information that you begin to truly understand to become competent and mastery, master uh, that subject. So small classes at these six colleges, I think something else that these colleges are pretty well known for are their support systems. And I see a variety of questions about what kind of supports do we offer to students? Uh, Sophia asked about it just broadly, how do we support students? Uh, Daniela asked about it in the context of minority students. Uh, Kushi asked about it in the context of first generation to college students and low income students. So maybe I'll come back to, uh, to Whitney for this. Can you talk a little bit about how colleges like ours uh, provide robust student supports to all students? I would be happy to, and those are really great questions. I'm glad that they are in the uh, question list so that Matt could bundle them together and we could get at that. We probably have different names for the different support networks that we have on our campuses, but another value of small colleges like ours is that we have built a community that truly starts in our offices of the admission staff who sort of in a, in a, um, in our own way, get to meet you when you're applicants and get to know you and are very deliberately putting together communities of people that we know will challenge each other and will really embrace the opportunities of what our schools provide. And so as we put a community together, we're also thinking about how that community can work, especially when we know that it's embedded with challenge in many ways on purpose. And so we know that students are coming to us from all over the world, as we talked about in the beginning of this live stream that, you know, visiting, there are a lot of students who come to our campuses who have never visited. That will certainly be the case as we go through this year. And how do we make those students feel at home? And how do we help students who are coming from families where they're the first ones to go away to college and they don't have anybody in the home to talk about what it was like when they did it or help them prepare for what to expect. So we set that up on our campuses and there's a lot of different ways of doing that. We have everything from in our, in our housing for our students, we all have some sort of residential life component that uses enrolled students, your peers who are upperclassmen, um, to be with you in your dorms and to be looking out for you and serve as peer mentors in some way and get to know you and what's going on for you. You all have faculty advisors at our schools. And again, one of the values of being in a small school is that the faculty members who are serving as advisors don't have very many advisees. So the idea is that they're going to get to meet with you regularly and get to know you, not just about what you're doing academically, but how you feel about how you're acclimating academically. They can also be the ones along with your direct faculty or a dean at your school who would be somebody who sort of manages the student affairs on campus um, or the res life staff or your friends that can be directing you toward um, academic support systems that we have that would have to do with tutoring or study skills or um, buddying up on certain things to help students um, prepare for things that are unfamiliar to them as they're getting ready for exams, study groups, and that sort of thing. We also have support for student aid. And in all of our student aid offices, we have staff that are there and available for students to be asking questions, for parents to be asking questions, to be able to do this in other languages to help families. So that as families and students are navigating their time at our colleges, that the aid is familiar and students are able to understand how they're supported there, whether that means they need a plane ticket home during an emergency that's not part of a financial aid package, or um, they may need a pair of glasses uh, replaced that broke and it's not in their budget. All of our schools have opportunities um, to support students through things like that. We also all have programming directly related to um, our minority students on campus and 
and offices set up for diversity, equity, inclusion, which not only supports the student experience, but also the faculty experience and classroom experience. We think about it really broadly on our campuses. Some of our schools have summer programming where students um, could arrive at the college in advance of orientation for the first year and get to know each other, get to know some of the faculty in the campus before launching into orientation with the rest of the first year class. I could go on with a lot of examples among our schools, but I hope what you're getting from my answer is that we think about these things really carefully in the idea of community that is built around being small. And as I said, it starts with us getting to know you before you even get here and, and then making sure we have systems in place, including mental health and wellness to help you all be really successful here, knowing that individuals will have their own individual worries and concerns and challenges while they're here. The one other thing I wanted to say as I was um, listening to some of the questions that were being posed and answered by my colleagues is around how are schools like us going to manage what applicants are putting in front of us this year. We talked about it as it related to test optional um, and there are questions that that I know are, you know, we talked about activities and what if we can't continue activities and I just want to remind students that we as admissions staff, like not just the deans, but the, everybody in our team and in our student aid offices and on, and on our campuses are also living in this environment where things that we're used to doing are not available to us now, or it might be available, but we're making a choice to not participate in it because of safety. And that the disruption that you're experiencing and very rightfully concerned that we might not we might not understand what's coming forward in your application. I just want you to know we couldn't be better prepped <laughs> for seeing what your experience has been because we are experiencing it in our own ways as well and um, are really sensitive to how different everything is for everybody, including what things might look like on your application. Right. This next one, so art, art is up next, although I hope that uh, others will also uh, help talk about the stories at our colleges collectively, who I see as uh, real leaders uh, on this topic. Uh, and, and that has to do with, uh, with racial justice. Um, we're here tonight, but even as we're here, um, game, you know, there's not going to be any games in the NBA or the WNBA tonight because of what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin to uh, Jacob Blake, which is awful. Uh, Breonna Taylor's killers are still uh, at large. Um, it's, this has been uh, a time when many institutions, including colleges, have been reckoning uh, with, uh, with the history of racism in this country. So I'll, I'll give you one of the questions that has, has spoken to this, which comes from Genève or Genève, um, who writes, our political culture is rapidly changing with the emphasis on race relations in America and the exposed needs of the healthcare and education systems. Many organizations let these subjects take a back seat in the wake of adapting to the pandemic. Are your institutions also focused on adapting academics, campus culture, and policies to reflect the shifting national conversation? Uh, this has been a lot of our uh, summers talking about this. Art, um, how, how would you frame it? Yeah, um, Matt, thank you um, for the question. and, and um, you know, I, I think it's, as, as, as we've seen over the course of the, the summer um, and even spring, um, the challenges that, that our country has been facing, I think that we're all thinking about ways in which our communities um, have been um, complicit in, 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 in some of these things, but also thinking about how we change our communities um, uh, for the better. Um, and I think that this is a conversation that is happening not sort of in, in isolated um, settings. You know, we're really thinking broadly about how our campuses can respond. How are we working with our students? How are we working with our faculty, our staff, our alums, and others who are really committed to our institutions to make them um, places that are much more equitable, places that are inclusive, um, places that really not just talk about value and diversity, but demonstrate that from the from the very start of the process 
um, as Whitney talked about, you know, from opening um, and being accessible through admissions, um, providing um, uh, support to make our campuses affordable. It's all because we're interested in creating a community that really is representative of a wide range of different experiences, different backgrounds, um, and different perspectives. Um, Seth talked about in his introduction about our institutions really being intentional communities. Um, and that's exactly why. Um, we want to create these intentional communities on our, on our campus because we know that having such varied opinions, varied insights, varied perspectives only make us better and make your education much stronger because of the fact that, that you can really debate and, and um, question your views on, on different ideas um, and perspectives, maybe long held views um, that you've had. And so our institutions, I would say, are, are set up exactly um, to, to really think about and run with making change um, and, and providing that opportunity um, to those who are connected with us. Um, but it, it takes effort. And, and we understand that th these are challenging moments um, and, and that we may get things wrong at times, um, but we're doing so really with the, the hope that our institutions can be those institutions that welcome everybody and support everybody. Um, and I would say that that's a clear message that we have from our, you know, every, all of our constituencies who are, who are part of our communities that are saying, you know, we, we could do better. Um, and I think all of us have, 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 have a long held commitment um, to diversity and inclusion. Um, but now it's really pushing ourselves even further to say, what more can we do as institutions um, um, to, to be places where all students are, are welcome um, and are connecting and, and can call our campuses home? I, I do. I, Art, um, that was beautiful. Um, and he, Art talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion on our campuses. This has become a um, a, a central pillar for how these schools operate uh, in this day and age. Um, I, I do want to go back to the, the classroom experience because I think part of this question was, so how, how, does, how does what has been happening nationally, how does that inform how education might happen on our campuses? Um, I, you know, I think the, the, the privilege of having a, a small environment uh, with faculty in small classes whose primary uh, purpose is to teach. They do a lot of research, but their primary purpose is to teach. Is They're not phoning this in. These are not lessons that were scripted five years, 10 years ago that are just on repeat. These, this is living, breathing education. I know I've heard our faculty, and I'm sure my colleagues would say the same with their faculty, talk about how are they going to incorporate what's been happening nationally, that what's been happening politically, what's been happening with uh, racial justice, what's been hap happening with social justice, what's been happening with income inequality, what's been happening in general, what's been happening to us into all facets. How does that impact biology, for example? How does that impact the study of economics? How does that impact the lens through which we see literature? Who are we even selecting to study in literature? And is it representative of the kinds of uh, experiences that we want our students to have um, so that they have this diverse perspective of the world. So what you're going to see, and I think this has always been true, but it, it has accelerated, I think, in, in light of what's been happening uh, in, this, in the country uh, over the last year, uh, I think you're gonna see a much greater infusion and a much greater um, uh, reliance on taking what's happening to 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 inform how uh, pedagogy is formed and how you're actually learning the things that are that are important uh, in in current affairs in 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 public affairs and, and and just what we see in the news all the time. I'm sure we all actually have a lot to say. I, I know I do. We have come to uh, 802, um, so we're, we're gonna uh, call it here. I know that some of you had questions we couldn't get to, 
Uh, but many of them are closely related to our upcoming topics, which I'll preview in a moment. So we'll set those aside and answer them in more detail during those sessions. Uh, in the meantime, you can check out our six college websites. All of them have ways to reach out for more info and our contact information. Uh, we know that you're facing a lot of Zoom time these days, so we really want to thank you for joining us. A huge thank you uh, to Janie at Bowdoin, aka Q&A support you've seen, uh, who is totally instrumental in developing this program, and to Holly at Carleton, who made tonight's program a reality. Uh, our next session is one week from today, September 2nd, and we'll be talking about faculty, academics, undergraduate research. Let me show you what's going on here. Um, this, is, this is what it looks like. Uh, and uh, we had lots of questions about applying during COVID. We'll cover that on October 13th. I hope you'll join us back then. Uh, more detail about affordability coming up about building a, a, an inclusive and equitable community and about outcomes. There were lots of questions tonight about uh, jobs and graduate school and medical school and things. We didn't get to those. We'll get to those on, on that date. Um, this was really a great conversation. I was so glad uh, that uh, you were able to join us. Um, next, the next session, we'll, you'll get to meet some new folks uh, we're the deans of admission, you'll get to meet the directors of admission from our uh, six schools, uh, and then we'll be back uh, for the session after that. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, have a great night. Be well, be safe. Uh, keep fighting the good fight. Thanks again. Good night.